Hi, I'm Christian and I'm making a tutorial series on how to make an awesome shmup and it's going great, but now I need some help with the design, so I'm asking some successful indie shmup devs for advice. Today is the second video of the series and today's guest is gonna be Danbo, the creator of the amazing Blue Revolver. Before we begin, there is going to be some gameplay footage in the background and that gameplay footage is me having fun with the game. And as you can probably tell, I'm not great at the game, so viewer discretion is advised. However, I will splice in a full playthrough of the game provided by Ectane. Ectane has some really cool Blue Revolver content, so be sure to check out his channel as well. Also, as always, this interview is going to be available as an audio-only version, so you can listen to it to like a podcast. A link to that is going to be down in the doobly-doo. But now, without any further ado, a warm welcome to Danbo. Hello there. Uh, my name is Danbo, as we've waited for. Uh, I am from Scotland. My most recent commercial work was Blue Revolver. Um, we are currently working on a large update to the game titled Blue Revolver Double Action. Um, I also work on personal prototypes here and there, one of which I released earlier this year. But, you know, that's, that's kind of a sideshow. And we're mostly going to be talking about um, stuff that I've learned during Blue Revolver and during the development of its update. What, uh, uh, there was a prototype. I missed the prototype. Can you, can you, since it's actual, can we get that out, out of the way? What is the name of the prototype? Uh, the name, I, I didn't really promote it very much. It was just ah. for a jam, and it was mostly to try some new things. Uh, I've so this year I've been learning Blender a lot, um, mm. 3D modeling, etc., for game assets, and that was kind of uh, a bit of a baptism by fire for trying to do everything. In trying to do a lot of things in Blender, like backgrounds, etc., some boss assets and all that. Some of it looks good, some of it is a bit muddy, kind of. But um, anyway, it was called uh, Defensor versus the Orb. Defensor versus the Orb, okay. Yes, uh, it was a two stage little prototype, um, some unique mechanics, uh, a funny boss. Um, it's on itch. It was done in a week, well, 10 days. Wow, <laughs> that's that's very rapid development for a shmup for a two st stage shmup. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's like the, the the actual game in Blender because I know that some people can make games in Blender, right? Uh, I I guess they can. I mean, uh, it's, it's so it's not in Blender. Uh, no, no, just the assets. Uh, the game is um, Love Two D, same as same as Blur uh, Revolver. Oh, okay, so. <laughs> That already answers one of my questions. So you're mm. working in Love to D on Blue or Revolver, yeah. right? Yep. That's super interesting because, like, quite often, um, you know, people ask when when working on Pico Eight because it's working with Lua. Mm. So people ask, you know, what is a good engine to graduate after after Pico Eight and and Lua Lua Love has been the go-to suggestion so far. Yeah, I mean, I can I can highly recommend it. Um, uh, with, with a contingency, I suppose, which is uh, not every tool is going to work for everyone. Mm. So if you're looking for, if you type in like Google or something and you look for what is a game engine that I can use, you'll get Game Maker or something, or you'll get something like Unity, Godot, um, yep. Unreal Engine. The, re the regulars. Yeah, and those are all based around like a scene graph paradigm. And if that's how your brain works, then that's great. Uh, me personally, I, I like when everything's in code, as much stuff as it's in code as possible. Um, hopefully in a, a kind of nice language like Lua that'll just let me shove everything into a table and forget about it, you know? <laughs> I, it's uh, one of my favorite features. <laughs> yeah, it's like tables are objects. It's the same thing. Yeah, everything's a table. Everything's a table. If that's a table. Tables everywhere. Um, so Blue Revolver came out in 2016. That's quite some time ago, right? That's correct, yes. Uh, so how long does it, did it take to develop Blue Revolver in the first place? Um, so we started... Um, so it was with Comic Z, uh, Keygen, and myself. So three um, people? Yeah, we started on a, a, a Ludum Dare in 2014. Oh. We did mm -hmm. a small kind of run and gun game called Red Entity, mm -hmm. um, and then from there we were really trying to like trying to build it out, and nothing really was coming to me. So I finally worked up the courage to say, "Can we work on uh, one of those funny games where you fly up and shoot stuff?" You know, I, I, I kind of like those. I like them. <laughs> it's, it's, it'll be easy, right, guys? 
well. Um, so we managed to get a little alpha demo of that out late uh, 2014 or maybe mm-hmm. early 2015, something like that. One stage demo, fine, fine, fine. And from there until, and then the g- full game was released October 2016. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a w- one and a half to two years of development time, roughly, right? Yeah, it's, it's something like that, yeah. That's pretty fast for a, you know such a polished game like this. Even then, it wasn't it wasn't like constant nose to the grindstone. You know, yeah, it's it's on and off trying to think about what to do. But I will say that it was quite a straight arrow in terms of development. Like mm-hmm. the the core mecha- like the core scoring mechanic of the game, which is the flourish system. Um, mm-hmm. I'll I'll ex- I'll describe it just for the yeah sure. Fan. I'll describe it for sports fans. Um, so you build up an eight chain. You, chains have a maximum limit of eight uh, eight uh, destroys or whatever. And then once it's full up, you use a special weapon which locks the chain at its current value and um, makes it drain. So you've got a short amount of time after you've built the chain to cash it in with your special weapon. Mm-hmm. Um, this is called the flourish system. Mm-hmm. And I had that idea in university in 2008. Okay, wow. <laughs> so you've I been really, playing shmups in a while for a while already, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. I started with giggling on the uh, Dreamcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time in university, I really wanted to, to be a melee attack, but no, um, I'm not so keen on that. I wasn't. Mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't become keen on that uh, later. Uh, later on, <laughs> makes um, a lot of things a lot more complicated. The, the yes, melee attack stuff. It oh. puts a lot of pressure on aspects of your game that might not be so. Uh, polished right so you were like really into shmups and and you um you wanted to create a shmup like this and and so for two two years you were working on or out roughly two years you were working blue revolver it came out in 2016 mm-hmm. and ever since then you're working on kind of like the follow-up the double action kind of game right um so after that we still had to ship replays which weren't in the game at launch unfortunately ah. um so worked, worked on that for a little while that was a bit slow but you know it came out eventually um, along with the summer update, which was a, you know, a few tweaks to uh, weapons mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, since then, it's been on and off with um, double action. I've, be, I've I've kind of been wavering a little on exactly what role the update should uh, fill, what what it should do, and what it shouldn't do. Um, I think now I'm much more clear on that. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so work is work is progressing on it, I suppose. It's surprising because like the initial game came out like in two years, but then uh, now it has been like seven years now since since Blue Revolver came out. So there's like this this huge disparity uh, of of development time, right? Yes, um, it's, it's difficult think... to do a follow up, right, on a good game. <laughs> it's not. It's part of it is the follow up, and part of it is that it's an update, which mm-hmm. you know changes what's there, and. My own experience has seen a lot of games that uh, kind of sanded themselves down, or kind of it took away took away too much with uh, with updates, etc. And mm-hmm. I desperately didn't want to fall into that particular pit. So you wanted to to offer new spicy uh, challenges and 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 uh, mm. you know polish the game without without sanding off the edges, right? Yes, like the 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 more the biggest. Um, conflict really that's been cooking in my mind for a while beyond uh, personal issues which is uh, health related, mental health related all that stuff, recovery from that mm. um, and when I finished uh, Blue Revolver I was kind of not living in a good situation, something like that so mm. covered for the map, that's good, that's good uh, but the, the, the conflict was so I wanted to make a really, really refined super elegant schmuck like Ketsui, like Don't Patch, whatever you want to say. Um, but the game in front of me, Blue Revolver, it's it's nice, it's very good, but a lot of what people like about it is that it's a little bit... It's a, maybe it's got a little bit of jank, maybe it's not so elegant, maybe the bosses can be very easily killed very quickly with specific uh-huh. setups, etc. Interesting. So I've had to really um, look at that, understand it, and trust people when they say that they like the game and then mm. work from that instead of my platonic ideal 
of a perfect shooting game. So nice. we're trying, trying to play to that, which is that this ultimately um, is a shooting game about being horrendously overpowered <laughs> and trying to play to that identity without and just for good or ill. Interesting. So you found that there was like like exploits and, and jankiness because the game was ex exposed to the, like this this kind of very competitive um, shmup scene, and you you felt you you you, you want to correct that. Um, it's it was my instinct to correct it. Mm -hmm. I'll say, mm -hmm. and to a degree, obviously, sometimes you do have to correct things, and sometimes um, you have to just let it ride. I think. So, for example. Um, If you look at the recent Shmup Slam uh, play of Blur Revolver, mm -hmm. the player uses the Stasis Field, which was devised as a defense weapon. So it's a little projection in front of the player. It sucks in kinetic energy from bullets and converts it to a charge, which is then discharged mm -hmm. in like a 300, 360 degrees radius around you. Um, and what this player found along with other players, I'm sure, but if you are, if you know exactly what you're doing, and you get up close to enemies, like bosses, etc., and you time it very well to deal with, like, big bursts of shots, etc., you can charge it up very quickly, and then discharge a lot of um, attack power into a boss, and speed kill phases in seconds. Oh, wow. So if you look at that, you really have to kind of kill the person inside you who's saying oh this should this this person shouldn't be doing no, that you're not doing it right you're not doing it right exactly <laughs> um so it's more a case of how can you make this more interesting mm. or how can you make this possible with other weapons maybe um there's another there's a, a exploit in the very in, there's a i suppose it's an oversight in the mm. scoring mechanic of the game Which is the idea is that you build up your ch you build up your chain with the main shot and then you cash it in with the special weapon. Okay, so the special weapon produces point items. The main shot doesn't. Mm -hmm. But what people found, what the world record found, what the world record holder found, etc., was that you can actually do both with the special weapon. You can build a chain and cash in on it at the same time without freezing it. If you time oh. it just right with a specific. <laughs> so again. The little person inside of you is going, no, don't let them do that. That's just mm. stupid. This is stupid. Stop then, having fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then you have to go, well, this person is, they've, they love the game. Clearly, they've enjoyed the game. They're um, interfacing with the systems. They're thinking about what's on the screen in front of them. And this is their response to the game. And again, you kind of just have to let it ride. Maybe make it a bit more interesting. Maybe... Yeah, lean more into what people do with your game, right? Mm -hmm. I, I really like that advice, and I think that's something that's uh, definitely something that we can take away from, especially working in a highly restricted engine like Pico 8, because it's like sometimes you just can't account for all of the things um, you know that can happen in the game and how people can break your game, mm. and and you feel like the need to do those things, and that will obviously cut into resources that you could use to instead lean more into these things maybe, uh, and and kind of like uh, let people have fun with your game, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before we get into into you know your tools and your process of how you how design is this thing, um, I also wanted to kind of like um, address at least one thing because something that really I found really striking about about uh, a blue revolver and something that it, I still feel like it's it's really awe inspiring is it has like this incredible visual identity. Like if you see a screenshot of blue revolver, blue revolver you immediately recognize it. Ah, that's that game, you know. Um, And it has to do like with a color palette, um, and you know, with the, with the characters, and also like this unique uh, pixel art style. Can you speak a little bit to how that came together? So obviously, I can't take the credit for that. I'm not the artist. The artists mm. are with with the cakes, um, Eric Montes and Comic Z. Mm -hmm. um, so what I can say is that we worked from a kind of off the shelf palette called Dawnbringer 16. Mm -hmm. You might have you might have seen it. There's a there's a website I really like called Low Spec, which is yeah. just lists of palettes. Yeah, you know, you know it. Yeah, 
We all know it, I'm sure. But um, of course, everybody, every pixel artist knows that. I think. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not. Hey, I'm not an artist, so you know, I was like, wow, can you imagine? This is. No, I but know. I mean that that's that website has grown to popularity. It's crazy. So these days, you can like I've been using some pixel art apps on the iPad, and it just like loads the palette directly from low spec. You can just type in the name of the low spec yeah, palette, and wow. it loads it into the pixel editor. Need that for Aceprite. Is 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 separate? How are you yeah, pronounce it's a, it? Yeah, I say Esprite. Everyone know. again, everyone knows what we're talking about. It's the yeah, it's the the amazing pixel art editor. Um, but um, Woof is just really amazing at using colors. I'd say because if you look at a lot of the example images for Dawnbringer, it's much more. It's like quite grimy. It's quite earthy in look, and that's just mm -hmm. not what. Wolf managed to get out of the palette. I was quick to sort of put those color values in the game engine and use them for all of our effects. Um, there's a very specific kind of twinkling little pixel particle effect, which is all over the game if you if you have a look at footage. But um, mm -hmm. for example, when you fire the laser or something like that, and it was very much inspired by the Don Patch, but it's very core to what I think is the look of the game as well that particular pixel effect. I mean, we weren't shy about using things about, you know, blending colors, using alpha blends, etc. cetera. Um, oh, so you do have alpha blending, right? Yes, yes. So um, sometimes technically a pixel on the screen could have a value that is not part of the palette, right? Oh, all the time, all the time. Hmm. But we used Dawnbreaker as a, as a base. In fact, there was a, there was a feature at one point where you could force the palette in the game to be, mm -hmm. Uh, whatever you like, really, and it kind of produced like a cool kind of like a weird bootleg effect. It might mm -hmm. show up in double action. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a cool idea. Yeah. So yeah, it looks like a what you look what the kind of game that you see if you buy a Game Boy Advance game that says Crazy Taxi or something. <laughs> I don't know. Was there a Crazy Taxi game for GBA? There probably was, but I'm not sure. Okay, wow, yeah, that that exists. Okay, if you buy Tekken for GBA. Okay, that exists too. What the heck is going on? So yeah, apart from that and just working to a very specific screen resolution, which you know, Pico 8 you'll be very familiar with. It's not the same resolution. Ours is um, 240 by 320, which is the same as uh, most classic arcade shoot -ups. So you already mentioned like Dodon Pachi and Katsui as kind of like the, the templates or like the, the things that, that inspired you. Were those kind of like the things that you were looking at when you tried to create a blue revolver? Were those the, the templates that you tried to follow? I wanted to make a clone of Muchi Muchi Pork. <laughs> okay, what, I don't know about that one. That's what I wanted. Uh, Muchi Muchi Pork? It's, it's cave. It's kind of late, JR, late era cave kind of. It's Yagawa. That was the the real inspiration, yes? I just wanted to make a clone of that game because I like it. It's a really fun game. I promise. Another game which is our real inspiration was like Cybern, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a, a very similar game. You've got like a, a special meter. You've got bombs, but you're a dragon. Um, mm -hmm. Really good game by uh, Kaneko, who made the Jackie Chan fighting games. Which are really good. Those are all. Those are an ex. Those are a masterclass in a game that's really jank and weird, but it's just pure fun. Even discounting the fact that there's three different versions of Jackie Chan and they're all incredibly strong. <laughs> in the same you game. Know? In the same game, yeah. <laughs> and 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 I've not finished. Um, this game has fatalities. You know, back in back oh. when all games are like you know ripping heads off, people getting cut in half, whatever. But Jackie Chan, he doesn't get fatalized. He just kind of falls on his back. He gets up. It gives you a thumbs up and says, "You're getting better." <laughs> that's Jackie Chan. How we love him. It, that, that's yes. just him. That's just like perfect uh, characterization. So, no, but I, I something that I'm really impressed by is uh, because I'm kind of surprised to hear that there is alpha blending because I haven't noticed myself. Because it seemed like when you were created Blue Revolver, you kind of like um, you really adhered to those self-imposed restrictions, like this color palette, this resolution. You know, mm. um, with a lot of pixel art games these days, um, 
you quite often f see that that the pixel art is not really taken that seriously like it's not really created as if it's at a certain resolution so mm -hmm. you know you have like something at a certain low resolution with chunky pixels but then you, the sprites start rotating and then you know you see that actually we're rendering this at a way higher resolution because the squares in, of the, the like the individual pixels also start rotating you know yes that's a that's not a it's not a great look um I, I always cringe when I see that. Well, people can be very kind of weird about this because, you know, one of the one of the things is like, oh, the scaling's wrong. Like, not every pixel is the same size. But if you play, like, Metal Slug and the first, like, soldier jumps out of the, the ruin, I think mm -hmm. it's a Metal Slug 1 or 2. I can't remember. But anyway, there's a set piece where you're destroying a building and then soldiers jump out and they're, like, huge on the screen. It's like they're jumping into the screen. And obviously yeah. that's scaling because it's the Neo Geo. And they really want to show that off. So it's not like all Yeah, but they're really like blowing it up so the pixels get bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's coming at you. It's like the... It, it, what, I, what I find problematic is like when you have like something like Stardew Valley, which is rendered at a certain resolution, mm -hmm. but then the text is rendered at a higher resolution. <laughs> so they kind of like well, cheat I mean, the resolution in there. <laughs> you know, rendering text at higher resolution is sounds really nice to me. I'd, I'd love that. But I, I, I mean, I understand why they made this decision. Don't get yeah, me wrong. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's move on to to talking about the workload because this is actually fascinating to me that you worked in Lua because Lua doesn't really have like a level editor that is built in like a game maker does, right? Hmm. So how did you go about creating the levels for, for example, for for a Blue Revolt? So each level had a slightly different workflow, which is just the kind of chaotic way that things actually tend to happen. But overall, each level has a you know, the tiled map editor, I'm sure. TMX, whatever. Um, so there's that for ground entities, the background, etc., the background layers, some of them anyway. Um, so that's for setting up like enemies on the ground, etc. And beyond that, it's just a huge array of events that happen at a particular position on the level. So mm -hmm. at Y equals 2000, let's spawn some enemies, etc., etc. Um, and that's, I kind of, I, I like that. Um, I don't like working with level editors usually. I like when everything's in code because I've got a really fancy text editor, so blank text. And I like wait, wait. So, so you made that list by hand? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's the wow. work. That's the work. Wow. That's the work. It's incredible. It's that's the work. It's playing the level, going, oh, Y two thousand. What was I thinking? <laughs> that's Y one nine eight zero at best. <laughs> that is incredible you just blew my mind there that is wow so yeah you just like sit down and you just like type in all the spawns by hand and then start the level and see if it works and if something's wrong then you move something by a couple of pixels by changing mm -hmm. the number right yes and obviously the game supports like hot swapping etc you can have hot swapping of code and so on in uh, lua ah. off with like so you the game is always open and yes. and you you can just reload the, the level yes when you do I, I would have okay. gone do lally if uh, if I had to re like reopen the game every single time so I can I can certainly stress the importance of stuff like that mm -hmm. also things like being able to start levels from arbitrary points get that mm -hmm. in the game early if you're if you want to have a nice level workflow uh, the most important thing of course is the old GMM GMFF button GMFF God mode fast forward. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> so while you're holding this button, you're invincible, and the game mm -hmm. runs at ten times the normal speed. Uh, okay, so you can scroll important. past sequences yes. that you not don't care about. Okay. And if I want to test the whole like fl screen flow of the game, I can run a whole credit just holding the fire button and the old GMFF. <laughs> just and like sitting there and then doing one CC run like this. And it's, yeah, and it's done in like two minutes. <laughs> and, I, and I can be sure that it's actually working. That's um, good. But yeah, like all of the levels are TMX file for whatever's on the ground and a big old array of events. Now, there's a yeah. little bit more. Maybe we'll go into the stages of how that gets built up, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So I suppose the most basic stage would be not even having that. And just mm -hmm. having like maybe, blank background. Yeah, yeah, blank background. Nothing on the no, 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 nothing on the ground. Just like, and maybe you just say randomly spawn this enemy, this enemy, this enemy. So that that's like your basic sandbox for making sure that the game doesn't immediately explode. 
Yeah, just then, testing maybe some enemy behaviors, just like spawning yes, some random enemies. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, or you might have like a little dev menu where you can spawn this enemy, this enemy, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So then you might go to like a, a list of events with a given like position on the stage, a little or a time perhaps, but I would tie it to a position because mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the stage, like the ground state, the ground enemies tied to and you want that to be in sync yeah. obviously the scrolling together with the background right yes yes so and after that start thinking about conditionals well after that i suppose implement ground enemies etc which is its own business um after that think about conditionals so what should i spawn this wave or not is there an enemy blocking this way um mm. if there's a mid boss don't swan these enemies, this enemy, this enemy, this enemy. That way, if the bot mid boss is destroyed early, as happens in Blue Revolver a lot of the time, then the, the enemy waves can take over. Um, ah, interesting. So you have like some logic behind the spawns. So to, to for example, if somebody kills the enemies very fast, to fill it, fill in the gaps, so so there's no dead space, right? Um. So it's not perfect in Blue Revolver, and. Like, I do think that a stage in a shmup shouldn't be, like, 100% flow. Mm -hmm. Like, you want it to have a little bit of, you know, it comes and goes, a little bit of push and pull, like, parts that are a little bit more spaced out, like, little breathers, etc., and then parts that are super, super intense. But I definitely think that could have been done better in at least the version of the Revolver that you can play right now. Mm -hmm. Um. So... Anyway, yes. The next step is thinking about conditionals, when to spawn this, when to spawn that. Then after that, you might go, instead of having one set position for a wave, you might have a start and an end. So that, wow. you know, if um, we're between here and here and this condition is freed up, then it can immediately push. Like, you can immediately spawn the wave then. Mm -hmm. So, and then, this is something that I've been experimenting with recently which is just kind of making this whole the whole conditional process easier, which is dividing the screen up into, like, horizontal lanes. I guess it'd be horizontal, mm -hmm. like, one to the left, one to the right, one to the middle, or, like, four or five or something like that, and then saying, this, this wave can go if there are no enemies in this lane. Wow. Yeah, okay, I see. So you focus very much on these kind of, like, logic structures logical structures to uh, to make sure that the, the the kind of like flow is maintained right yes it's all it's um i think levels are just at the end of the day it's all going to be bespoke i think like a fancy system if you have a fancy system that tries to quote intelligently fill the space etc then you end up losing control over the levels and that's a really that's a harsh thing to have in a shooting game because um, if you like a shooting game, the player is very specifically tied to this fixed scroll speed through the stage, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that the onus is entirely on you to make sure that's good. Um, it's not like, you know, if I'm playing Doom or whatever, and this is kind of a, a an empty part of the map, I can just go faster through that. Or if it's mm. if it's clogged up with monsters, I can take my time. It's not like yeah. That. If you don't deliver any enemies, then it's just going to be dead air. Yes, know? exactly. So there's there's other ways of doing it too. Um, I think one in, one approach which was really interesting and kind of made me a little bit jealous as a developer was um, have you played the white vanilla mode in Zero Ranger? I I wasn't sure if I should because I haven't once seen that one as as well. Well, the idea there is that um, it's just very very short stage sections which are very strictly cordoned uh, off. Right, I remember now. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So you can very easily like put together like a, a fifteen second stretch of gameplay and then just stitch those together. Now that's a that's a. I think that would be a very quick way to work. Certainly. If you were I remember the there cloth. was um, there was a shmup that did something similar. Um, it was on uh, Eskatos, I think. It was uh, it was bundled with Eskatos always. Oh, something uh, silver, something. Judgment Silver Sword. That's right. That's one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So the, the, the idea that, yeah, that you, instead of having like very long continuous level, you have like these kind of like waves almost. Mm -hmm. And after finishing every wave, you get actually a score <laughs> showing you that, hey, you completed this wave. Yeah, and a wave. handful of the Toho games are like that as well. Legacy Lunatic Kingdom, 18.5, whatever it's called. Um, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think that's a quick way to work, certainly. Though I suppose you do lose out on, if you think about a game like Rayforce, which is beautiful based on your progression through the level. Like you can see mm. all the layers moving, you're slowly moving through them, there's all this weird 3D stuff going on. So I guess you'd lose out on the potential for that, but um, you know, I think it could be a good way to work. Yeah, I, I, I was actually tempted by this because for a small engine like we create, that actually works a little bit better. <clears throat> And also, I really did like the fact that you get like such immediate feedback. You know, it's like, yeah, I did this now. You know, mm. it's always a bit problematic with maps where it's like you fight your way through this thing and you struggle, you struggle, you struggle, and you die, and you feel like, okay, now I have to redo this. You know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's like, what have I achieved? You know, I just made it somewhere into the level. You know, but if you can tell, like, oh, I made it to wave twelve. And next time I'm going to make it, try to make it to wave 13. It feels like the progress you made is more tangible. You lose out on, you, you would lose out on that Rayforce kind of vibe as well as a sense of pure flow, um, mm -hmm. which can't be understated, uh, can't be overstated, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, I mean, a lot of what I try to do with stages, the, the first thing I do is I get a music file. I get the music ah. file for the stage. Mm, okay. And then I think about what should happen here. Oh, this part sounds nice. It would be cool if the mid boss swooped in here. Often for Blue Revolver, the first thing I did was the mid boss. Okay, that's good because we talked about Barcock exactly the same thing. Yeah, so music is there first, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. music, because musicians have a incredibly strong work ethic. It's amazing. Compared to programmers. Yeah, but, but also like what Bokok said, and I think you, I know, I definitely agreed. Um, and, and that like shmups are kind of like music in a sense that there's like, you know, a layering of, of things happening and there's like a sequence of events playing out, multiple things happening at the same time. There is like a, um, I'm rising and, and, you know, the action is rising and, and, and yeah. there's a lull in between there maybe, you know. That, what I talked about earlier, the whole, you're, we're very rigidly tethered to this scroll speed. You know, we can't, the player can't arbitrarily speed things up or slow things down. That's, that is a weakness, but it can be a huge strength that few other genres can have because we have absolute control. We can make sure they are zooming through a particular point when the music drops and so on. So, um, yes, uh, trying to turn our, a huge weakness into perhaps a greatest strength for the genre. But that's amazing that you have the music, but still, when you design the level, you all you just see is numbers, you know. <laughs> so you don't don't hear the music while you're making the decisions, right? Um, well, I would. What I would do is I would uh, just play like a blank stage with the music, and mm -hmm. then uh, I would record like I would note down the position at particular points of the music where it's like you know like when it goes quiet or when there's a kind of a. A bridge in the music i don't i don't know music theory i'm sorry yeah sure sure yeah, me neither uh, it's fine <laughs> but you know when I, whenever there's a, a point in the music where i think oh yeah the mid ball should be in here and then it's here for a little bit and then it's out um so yeah i would just note down uh, like a lot of that stuff and then that creates kind of the basic skeleton of the stage mm -hmm. um for making like big set pieces etc and then after that it's filling in the blanks with um with uh the aforementioned waves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but <clears throat> maybe just, just to go back real quick because you said at the beginning that the background is like a file that you load in so where did you create that file uh the tiled map editor um mm -hmm. it's an open source ah yeah yeah it's a like a universal tile editor that you yes. can export yes. something i'm, I'm okay. sure you could make command and conquer maps of it if you wanted to but uh in this case it's making blur revolver maps so yes. you just make like a very narrow, very yes. very tall map, and then you load that into into a lot. That may have some of the image data, but it's, it's probably better if the game just handles that directly. Um, but most crucially, it has like little placeholders for the enemies, saying like a tank should be here, it should be pointing at angle thirty, because in tiled you can like you you can basically draw shapes, give them a class, and then give them custom properties, which is very useful. Um, also, like extra data like shadow information mm -hmm. so basically just drawing a shape and saying 
like the player should have a shadow here, flying enemies should have a shadow here. Okay, so if you say that you do the the entire timing, the entire like I, I call it spawn schedule. Mm -hmm. If you do that in code, then I assume you also do all of the um, enemy interaction, all of the enemy behavior. That's also probably ha hand coded, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Wow, you madman! I don't understand another way to do it. I like when everything's. I like when everything's in my head or when it's in code. Yeah, I mean, this makes sense. Like everybody has like their own approach, and I mean, you take advantage of it. Like from what I heard, is like, you know, the spawning is so much more intelligent in your game than, for example, in my game, where it's like I just have like right now I just have like the very rigid starting positions as like this enemy spawns here at this very specific time but you seem to be more working with like making the programming do the work for you a little bit to, to a point but at the end of the day like i say um level design is always going to be very highly bespoke um we're not making roguelikes we're not making them um no and although some people try well, some people do uh and that's, them. And that's fine but um i, I do think that level design in itself has become really kind of a lost art, I would say, in the whole games, like across games as a, as a phenomenon. Mm. Um, because it is so highly bespoken, because everything has to come together at once. It's, it's, it's just always going to be a, a very bespoke thing. And I suppose the process should reflect that. You sent me some screenshots and I saw that um, you sh show me like a dev menu and you have like this enemy, you, I, I think we already talked about this a little bit, you have like this enemy test state where it's like yes. this, this this test environment mm. where you can load in an enemy and you can see how they behave, right? Yeah, uh, I'm sure you have. You've seen the Matrix, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know the, the whole construct thing where they go in and they're like, <laughs> I want guns, I want lots of guns. Well, I'm in there and I'm like, give me enemy type one. <laughs> Lots that's of so them. funny because that that's exactly how, how I feel when I develop. Yeah, that. okay. I mean, that's, you know, you get to be the, the king of test stage one. Mm. Dot lure. Um. Anyway, but yeah, it's it's just a big menu where I've got every single enemy type, and it just keeps on spawning until. Um, oh, so it repeatedly spawns, so you can try. It, it, it tries to. Time. Sometimes it gets a little confused because it's just a dev tool, and those things don't get polished off uh, usually. Um, it just has to. It just works as much as it needs to, and obviously at the same time I've got the code running and I just make changes and hot swap them. That's that's amazing. That's that's really cool. Um, okay, so okay, so we have the levels. We have an idea of how the levels work. We have an idea of how the enemies work. What about bullet patterns, though? So for bullet patterns, uh, this will surprise you. It's in code. What a surprise! Yeah, I, I, I've looked at projects like Bullet ML, markup languages like that, but for me, and again, like what I was saying earlier, is that just uh, everyone's heads are so different. We, you get to realize that, I suppose. Uh, so yeah. not everyone is going to end up using the same tool. And I just, a markup language for describing like a timed series of events, it, it doesn't really gel well with me. So mm -hmm. for me, it's just. A bunch of like time, like timed callback functions saying, okay, in 0.1 seconds, fire this, then in 0.2 seconds, fire this, uh, and then just loop um, from 90 degrees to negative 90 degrees, incremented in five, fire a bullet, whatever, whatever. When bullet, like, maybe we'll talk more about the, the design of bullet patterns. Sure. So, right. in my estimation, there's three ways to fire a bullet, more or less. There's, there's, mm -hmm. there's borderliners, but First way is to aim at the player. That's the most, you know, anyone can fire the player. Kill the player. The right? player. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, like, for the player, it's very trivially easy to dodge an aimed shot, right? So yeah. we've got them, we've, we're pressuring them to move around a little bit, but it's still completely facile. Like, if you play, like, the early stages of some Sekio games, you can literally just waggle the joystick because the bullets are all aimed at you and they're so fast that... Um, you're probably like they're probably gonna be gone by the time you're doubling back. So you can yeah, just, just just move one pixel to the left, and then all of the bullets will will, will yes, exactly. don't hit you anymore. Well, I mean, not even just not even streaming like that. Like you know, when you were eight and you were in the arcade. Maybe I don't know if you. Well, anyway. But, <laughs> well, I I'm, yeah yeah I wasn't eight. Uh, I wasn't arcade when I was eight. Yeah. Well, the game's sure. in attract mode, right? And mm -hmm. you don't have any money because you're eight. 
Perish the thought. So you go up and you mash the buttons and you waggle a stick and you go, look, everyone, I'm playing the game. But this this waggle motion, just randomly moving, is the apex of early game. Um, High strats. Yes, in in kind of, though eventually those games, like in the later stages, they will absolutely punish you for that. But Hmm. I'm just describing the... um, the consequences of firing too many shots at the player. If you want to kill a seasoned bullet hell professional player, you don't aim at them. So the second a the second type of firing a bullet is let the player come to you. <laughs> well, sort of actually, but the second way is what I call field shots. You might call them spam shots, soup shots. You can call them anything, but they're more the kind of pretty patterns that envelop the whole playfield, and they create this sort of terrain in the playfield that the player has to maneuver around. So they complicate movement. Mm -hmm. So if we have aimed bullets and field bullets, then immediately we have kind of the core conflict that the player must solve in shooting games, which was, I need to move now, but moving is so hard. So we're pushing, we're kind of pushing and pulling the, the player for all of this. And then the third type, which is a bit more academic, which is like a entrapment kind of bullet. Mm-hmm. So maybe you're locking down a particular part of the stage. Maybe you're firing in like a cone around the player to keep them from getting too many ideas. Or maybe you're firing like a big wall such that the player has to move all the way to the right or perish. So these are much more prescriptivist. Um, so I would say that's the third way. I mean, like... Yeah, I have heard the term area denial... <laughs> Yes, that's a that's a great way to put it. Yeah. There are obviously more ways of firing a bullet, but um, these these are that's a good way to start your thinking. Mm-hmm. So like, okay, uh, so these are like your your broad three categories that you work with when yes. you're trying to come so up. So I would with. I would start I would start by thinking of like an aimed shot and then a field shot or maybe a trap shot, and just building up there. Not usually having all three like super like super all three types of bullet at the same time because then it just becomes a, a mess that's no fun. Because the, sure. the fun is in the push and pull. Um, I think one really good way to come up with a bullet pattern is to think up a rhythm of fire. Mm-hmm. So if you have you played Chorensha? I played it briefly, yes. Uh, and I definitely, Ectane t- totally tries to make me play that, <laughs> that mm. game. Well, one thing that game is absolutely godlike at, along with everything else, is this this idea of a pattern of fire... So particularly the later bosses, like when you're when you're sitting there dodging, like it's got really good sound design and mm. all the patterns are like ah. So mm-hmm. think about that type of rhythm, like I don't know if that comes through in the microphone. Yeah, no, it's it's music again, right? It's like I a suppose, different yeah. aspect of the music, right? Yeah. Um, Though like, syncing that up with music would be uh, too academic, I think. No, no. What I mean is like it's musical thinking. You know, you're yes, thinking about yes. the rhythm of things happening. You mm-hmm. something that's re- repeating, maybe something that establishes some some kind of pattern that you can latch onto and that your mind can latch onto. So those are those are two. I guess you might say those are the X and Y of the skeleton on which you could build a bullet pattern. One nice thing about the whole rhythm thing is that it's very quick for the player to learn. Mm. Like once you hear, you you know that you know that what's what what, you know what's going to come next. You know what you're in the middle of. That totally makes sense, actually, because if you think about it, what you're doing is you're setting up a rhythm, and what the player has to do is to dance to that rhythm, basically, when they're trying to avoid that, right? Yeah, that's that's actually a cool way to think about patterns. I haven't thought about about bullet patterns like this before, so this is actually this opens this opens like a third eye in my in my head right now. This is this actually cool. Hmm. And also, like uh, you can also think about where you're firing things from, which isn't so important, but you can do fun things like disabling parts of a boss, and uh, which then disables part of the bullet pattern, which opens up strategies for the player, etc. One... I, I love, I love that part. I love when you can destroy a boss part by part. That always feels so. I don't know. It it makes the bosses more tangible somehow. Yeah. One thing I really like about uh, Truxton or Tatsujin or whatever you want to call it is that there's quite a few bosses in there which are just like a couple of big lads moving in a formation. 
And it's the same enemy, it's the same kind of boss class enemy, and they're firing the same sort of pattern, but like they're, because they're all doing the same thing and they're just moving in this kind of formation, like it's very easy to immediately understand what you can do here. Like you can maybe get really aggressive and try to get one out of the way as soon as possible, and then you're dealing with much less stuff going on. Maybe you can wait until they're all close up, they're clumped up, and then get them with a bomb, etc. So I think that that could also be like a really a really quick way to develop a boss, which we didn't really do. Um, I did it in uh, that prototype that I talked about earlier, slightly, but mm-hmm. just like a formation of a couple of mid class enemies. They've got a bit of tankiness to them, but not a huge amount. And they're just kind of all doing similar things, and then it's it's very like easy for the player to organically shut down this part, this part, this part, and you might even tie that into a scoring system if you want to be really nuts. Ah, I, I really like this approach as well. So, what so far what you're talking about is is like kind of how to make because usually you think about when 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 especially when players talk about challenge, they think about you know oh how the game is trying to kill me and, and so forth. But what we're talking about here is actually kind of like the opposite. How can we make the game uh, readable and predictable for the players so Hmm. they can develop strategies on how to overcome those challenges? Yeah, we just want to make the players dance, but nobody dances without a song. Nope. Yeah, gotta gotta have a banger (laughs) to get them on the dance floor. Hmm. Um, So just briefly, because um, you've been doing uh, most of the design work and then the development work for this, and then you had people coming in for the artwork and for the music. Is that right? Uh, yes. So did you do any kind of coordination? Did you have like any, like for example, for your musician, because you start with the music, so did you have did you have like a, oh, I need a song that goes like this and this for this stage or something like this? Or how did that go? How did the coordination go? Um, so fairly early on, we decided let's just do a five-stage game. Fair enough. And okay, so that was Im- immediately uh, like an th- assumption you're going into the game, right? Most of my favorite shmups had five levels. I thought... This can also follow in those footsteps. Four is two. Okay. Four isn't enough. Four is is risking it a little bit. Though actually, I mean, Great Fairy Wars does a lot with three. So, <laughs> so nothing's ever nothing's ever a hundred percent. But anyway, we went to five. Sure. And five, I was, five seems fine. And I was very very strict about the timing of the run, like how long mm-hmm. one run should take, because I have vanishingly little patience for run based games that are super long, like a lot of kind of action roguelites that come out now it's like a, an hour run and i'm like man man i was playing darkest dungeon 2 that game's like mm. three hours for a run man i mean that's not a shmup but i suppose it's got a bit of auto scrolling going on though yeah i guess um but yeah i was very strict like 25 minutes let's go for 25 minutes so then divided up 25 minutes among the levels, saying like, if there, if a boss is like two minutes, make the little stage about four minutes, come up with a piece of music for that. Um, have it, give, give me some, I was very hands off with the music to be honest, but I just said like, I linked like a, a couple of like the Espigaluda tracks. I was like, this is cool, right? Mm-hmm. And apart from that, just like trying to say, just have like bridges, have like kind of, parts where it's slower, parts where it's faster um, to work off of there. Um, but Keygen, our original musician, was he had the, all, he had the whole soundtrack going in an uh, incredibly short amount of time. That's amazing. And um, um, yeah, a lot of people are going to shriek in horror at this one, but I, I made the artists and musicians use Git for checking in assets. What? Well, specifically GitHub desktop. I, I'll, I'll sand it off a little bit. Uh, I don't know if that's better or worse, depending on where you're coming from. <laughs> you had a problem with it. <laughs> so there might be some purists who will be like, what, you're not using command line interface? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. But um, but I mean, version control is, is so important. Like, yeah. it's hard to hard to overstate how important it is. And a nice thing about the whole GitHub thing is that it's got like issues, wiki built in, which can help for coordinating. Um, there wasn't really a design document for the game. Mm-hmm at all like a prescriptivist design document because like it was kind of i mean i was doing most of the implementation of the game there was a lot of to-do lists um all of the moscow method do you know that the moscow method no i haven't heard about it. so it's a it's a thing from software development um given a to-do list you divide things up into m s c w must should 
could, would. Uh, I, I, it, it rings a bell. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's very common. I'm sure you'll have seen it in some form. Maybe I haven't heard the name, but I, I, I like these, these sounds familiar. Uh-huh. So you use that for, 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 to organize the, the workflow between people? Mm-hmm. Yep. And again, like I was, I was hands off with um, what I asked about enemies as well. Like I just said, yeah. Like, so, so that, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. So more or less, I just said, give me a good mix of enemies. I'm not very good at directing people. <laughs> So I just said, give me some small guys, some medium guys, some large guys. Um, give me a zoo, and I can pick my animal. Yeah, like a painter's palette. And then I looked at those and how Woof animated them, and I decided behavior based on those. Ah, interesting. And so you were kind of like partially inspired by the art that that um, yes, the pixel art absolutely. did for you. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, and so how many did you ask for? I don't think I asked for a specific amount. Um, just, just make some, and then did you have a situation where you ran out of sprites and you? I, I can't like, remember how many individual enemies there are in Blue Revolver. I think it's about fifty. Mm. Oh wow. Um, but yeah, uh, just whatever. And there's some assets in there that aren't even used. Oh, there might be just mm. a double action. Have a look when it comes out. I looked at enemies, decided from the way they are animated, what would be a nice way to have them behave. Like some enemies come in, they spin for a little bit, they fire, and then they spin, and then they go away, etc. I think mm-hmm. one good paradigm to go for with enemies is that it's kind of two types. So enemies that are moving around a lot, that aim at the player, and enemies mm-hmm. that are more immobile, that kind of anchor the playfield, that spam the playfield. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like dangerous that are kind of stationary that you have to take care of? And other things that kind of like um, follow you around, right? Yeah, like maybe not follow you around, but just kind of moving around in kind of ways that makes it a little bit harder to hit. So mm-hmm. that way, like it's that way, it's much easier to make things interplay. Mm-hmm. So again, what we we're talking about earlier with aimed shots and field shots, like you can kind of have a lot of aimed shots going at the same time, and that's fine. You can have an aimed shot and some uh, like some field shots going, at, and that's fine. Too many field shots, not a good time. So, yeah, let the aim shots come from like the more mobile enemies, I'd say, and let the mm-hmm. anchors on the stage really do the more set piece kind of bullet patterns, more pretty stuff. Um, did you have because sometimes you have like in shmups you have like these things that's that's because I'm still want to I'm still kind of like my my mind is still reeling about the fact that you did everything <laughs> in code. So what did you do when you wanted to have like an enemy describe like maybe some kind of like a nice arc or like a wavy line or something like this? Did you hard code that as well? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, just like here's a rotation variable at this point mm-hmm. between this variable to be this, and then just move by that just rotate a vector by that rotation and then move them by that um yeah and just like launch an enemy into your test environment and see how it behaves and then tweak the numbers right so there's not like any incredibly complex like bezier curve stuff you won't be doing like have you played like galaga um yeah like the galactic exactly the galactic dancing stages where things are moving around in all kinds of weird loops and so so there's there's probably none of that because i'm not going to hand code that you know um, if I was, I would just probably define some waypoints on the screen and then tween between those with a little bit of smoothing it out. No, I'm asking because a lot of people who want to create like this effect, you know, the Galaga or whatever, like mm. in, uh, I think in uh, Gradius, there's also some kind of enemies doing these kinds of stuff. Um, they always end up like they kind of like try to reverse engineer this and they end up creating like a spline editor or something like this, you know? I think Tiled does. I think Tiled does have a spline editor. Which might be mm-hmm. useful, but yeah, I'm, I wouldn't be the person to ask about stuff like that. No, no, it's just I'm asking like how, how you did it. So it's, mm-hmm. it's interesting to hear that that you uh, decided not to have these kinds of capabilities that you uh, relied on your coding skills. That's actually super fascinating. So you kind of like dev- discovered what levels are going in, having the music in, and you just like start working on the level, and you then have like your zoo of enemies that you pick and choose, and then uh, and you kind of like developed organically what the game, what the level was uh, during development. Is that correct, or did you have like some vague ideas, some some themes maybe going into a certain level already beforehand? So I would have set pieces in mind, 
So mm-hmm. wouldn't it be nice if like there was a large thing that the player had to pick apart, or mm-hmm. if there was a big enemy on this side, but the player also had to deal with stuff from this side, etc. So I think a lot of stuff like that, cool kind of set PC encounters that are a little bit more strictly designed, perhaps. That's where more of the conditional logic around spawns comes in, because mm-hmm. they're more complex, so you have to be a bit more um, strict. And then, again, uh, putting waves in just the right place to kind of fill the space between those and still be interesting. So when you we're talking about the flow and so forth. So when you're designing a level, are you do you have a specific route in mind that the player should follow, or is are you just trying to kind of create interesting situations? I mean, thinking about the path the player takes is important. You have to th- like another uh, fundamental conflict of shooting games is that usually you're you're shooting up, you're shooting up mm-hmm. the way. You have a very limited range of uh, shot. It can be quite hard to make a a good shot where the player can freely aim because they just have too much control, so they can't be pushed and pulled through the screen. I mean, there's the very standard toe plan zigzag that everyone's familiar with where you just move left, right, left, right, etc. Um, and that's good. That's a good way to start off. You're thinking about the right things. I mean, if someone's boiled their head in shooting games for years, they'll know to anticipate it. Like, if they see a bunch of stuff coming in from the left, they'll mean okay, well, I'm obviously going right next. <laughs> but I mean, that's fine as long as the player is being pushed and pulled through interesting stuff. Yeah, also thinking about uh, set pieces and things like that, I think that's one of the reasons people love the treasure sh- uh, shooting games so much, is that in Radiant Silver Gun or Ikarga, you're almost constantly in some sort of set piece. Mm. Even if it is like just a bunch of boxes coming at you that you have to deal with. I think that's a huge strength of those games that um, it's kind of easy to overlook. Um, I th- yeah, I think you always you always at a certain place. Like you can always at any any encounter has a characteristic like a, it's memorable. In some yeah, Garega is a lot like that as well. I think it's very very diverse. The player is always in a different sort of situation with different, almost different rules, um, which is why that game is so complex and why it's still so obsessively played today. Uh, Zero Ranger is also a little bit like that. No, oh, yeah, definitely. Like you're always doing something different. So you were talking about how you listen to music and so forth, um, and we're also talking about these kinds of like wave-based shmups. Um, so is that what you also do when you design a level where you kind of like, um, you know, create like chunks of space or where you're like, okay, this is the first section, this is the second section where this happens, this is the third section where this happens. Do you have like, do you chunk the encounters or do you just like continuously design the entire level? Oh yeah, you have to, you have to divvy it up, otherwise you'd go insane. Mm-hmm. Um, like, <laughs> Uh, the the most Im- the most important thing is to uh, have a development environment where you can quickly jump into a given part of a stage. The whole practice uh, mode in Blue Revolver stems from that. It's got checkpoints where you can say, "I want to spawn at the start, at the boss, at the mid boss, after the mid boss," and like a lot of people were saying, "This is really this is really great stuff." Like not a lot of games offer this kind of control, and it's like this kind of just arose out of our development environment and just be trying to make stages. So yeah, try and have that sort of capability. It doesn't have to be super, like sometimes it can be a little bit annoying to make sure like the ground and the, the sky is syncing up as well as the music. It doesn't need to be super accurate. Like it doesn't need to be pixel act- accurate anyway, but you just need to be able to quickly do this, this part again and again and again until it's nice. And then this part again and again and again until it's nice. And then this part again and again. And then hopefully you go through in a in a wani, and then it's all good. So the the checkpoints that we have in the stage select mode is that something that uh, are these the same checkpoints that you used, or did you have even finer checkpoints? We had more checkpoints, like there's one that makes the boss immediately appear instead of having the the usual preamble, which will probably be exposed in double action because people people just want to practice the boss, you know. Mm, they don't want to mm. see the intro and they don't want to shoot the resupply ship. Um, also, spawning a boss and immediately making them move to a given pattern, a given phase in their attack strategy. That's really important. But I think a lot of people would naturally um, put something like that in. Like the whole, uh, like in Toho 8, Imperishable Night, the whole spell practice mode where you can individually try each spell card in the game, that's probably 
um, just the development tool that he had, and he put a little bit of a, yeah. he put a, a, some polish on it and a, a few unlockables, and it's like it's one of people's most favorite features about that game. Yeah, it's a free feature. It's great. You already ha- you already have it. Mm. All right. So let's something that I I'm kind of struggling with right now is that um, how about things like the player's abilities or um, you know the scoring system, your know, mechanical stuff. Is that something that you settled on before going into level design, or is that something that evolved during you designing levels? Again, it was a very straight arrow. The mm. the details of the scoring system were all done by the alpha demo by the time one wow. stage was done. Fair, okay, fair. so on the first stage you settled on everything. Yeah, barely changed before um, between that and the the full release. Um, mm. I mean, the, the roles of the special weapons certainly changed. Um, before it was like a like what would be the hyper laser in retail was the focused shot in 0.1, etc. So little changes like that. But in terms of the idea of the scoring system, that was very early. And the controls especially were very early. You have to do that stuff very early because everything stems from them. Yeah, yeah. you cannot make... Because if you build everything on top of that mm. and then you make some changes under underlying tenants, it's kind of like might... You know, the previous levels might break because yeah. your abilities are different it, now, right? I, uh, here's a tangent. The, do you know the Resident Evil 4 remake? Mm, g- yes, I haven't played it. I haven't played it either. Uh, but I looked at it and I went, that's an impossible task. <laughs> because Resident Evil 4... Because everything is designed around the awkward controls. Yes, thing. Resident Evil 4, very awkward. and your, your guy is basically a tank, like except you're just looking at him from behind. Um, you can't move and shoot at the same time. You can't move and aim at the same time. When you're aiming, you're rooted to the spot. Your aim comes out in a predefined position, which is why some weapons are better than others. Um, I could talk for a long time about Resident Evil games. Um <laughs> But if they want to have a more fluid control system or whatever, sure, whatever. But they're also going to have to have these environments people remember, like this, the village at the start or the funny like rail car section or uh, the bit with all the bear traps. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, so mm-hmm. there, I thought that's going to be really hard for them to reconcile. Um there's a, t- there's a sense looking at games like that now where it's like, does every game have to control the same way? It's, um, yeah, the consolidation is, is clear. Yeah, everything is kind mm. of like merging into a blob, right? Like Resident Evil 4 got so much, got so much tension because you're literally buying space with every shot you take and every like cool kick or whatever you do. Um, off of this kind of awkward control system, like your every headshot is buying you like a couple of meters, basically. So yeah. if you take if you take this away because because every game has to control the same way, uh, what do we get instead? Parries? Mm. Uh, I don't know, man. That's <laughs> oh, also kind of there's a lot of that going around. I'm not a fan of parries in general. <laughs> there's a lot of that going around as well these days. Um, mm. I mean, if, if we have an hour to talk, I'll talk about dodge rolls because I really don't like those. <laughs> Okay, let's not get, let's let's st- let's stick with most yeah, for now, yeah, yeah. Um, because I, I actually okay. The next next question is a bit of a call out. Ooh. it's it's a bit of a call out from Bark Hog. Oh dear, is this about um, a set number of bullets on screen at one time? No, but that's also an interesting question. Uh, oh. I, uh, this is a question about how did you settle on the speed values of of your ship and uh, like speed values of the bullets. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk some trash about Blue Revolver a little bit. Yeah, turn back, Dombo, turn back, please. I beg you. Okay, but anyway, um, I played Blue Revolver like when it came out, and I felt like the ship speed were too extreme. Like when I pressed the focus button, it like cut the ship speed in half, and I was like, this does not feel good to me. Maybe he means that this the this the player speed is like variable depending on shot type. It's configurable to a degree, like you can pick between certain move speeds. Um, maybe he means that like the focus speed is always the same I felt that was necessary like it's always uh, 120 per second something like that whereas the unfocused movement speed is like it goes from like 160 all the way to like 220 or something one thing I did after the fact was I went through like a ton of like arcade uh, shooting games K2 
cave rising at each other, just your classics, whether I could play in MAME, really, and mm -hmm. um, try to record via very primitive methods, like counting pixels in various screenshots, um, etc. Um, like what the player's movement speed is. And I think what I came to was about 160, like assuming a 240 by 320 canvas, about 160 pixels a second. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be a good place to start off of. But so did you just like lift those values directly from other games or did you do like some your own tweaking? Uh, the, the movement speed was done by feel initially. Um, I did mm. th that whole research came after, <laughs> which is the wrong oh, interesting. which is the wrong way to do it, of course. But I mean, that's just how. It... So, so did the research change anything? No. Mm, oh no. Um, so it was just like double checking if you got it if you got it well, right by well, gut. Like I'm saying, like like we were saying before, like all of the the enemy designs and the bullet patterns were based on this movement speed, um, mm -hmm. which is why it's probably. If, oh, if, so you did the research that late into development, like yeah, yeah, yeah. after the levels were oh, after the game okay. um, it, it, it didn't really occur to me before. <laughs> so it was like a, just to satisfy your curiosity, yeah, if you got it right. I do, right? I do stuff like that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what a bow's move! I'm just gonna do this little research. <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, everything stems from curiosity, but sure. uh, yeah, all like I, I couldn't go back and change it at the time because all of the enemy. The behaviors, the built patterns, etc., were based around this uh, one movement speed, really, which is why it was probably a mistake to have multiple movement speeds in the game. I just remember people mm -hmm. saying this is too fast and believing them, mm -hmm. which um, maybe I should have just uh, stuck to my guns. Maybe I don't know. It's probably it not. Seems like you have you have you trust your guts, man. You just keep trusting your guts. It seems like it let you it got you very far, you know. It's not the end of the world if someone can pick a non-optimal move speed. Mm. Is essentially the the lesson learned there. Um, so yeah, and I mean, if it's comfy for someone, that's well, that's fine. Interesting, interesting. But I'm not sure what um, this what this uh, beef of bog hog is. That's curious. Yeah, I I remember having a, a discussion about life bars on the electric. So what is the life bar? Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that discussion. Can you can you summarize? Um, well, I used to not like them. I still don't. Uh -huh. uh, but I've, I I I like for that uh, prototype defensor versus the orb. I tried to come up with like a a spin on it that I thought was cute because the problem I have with life bars is that when the player has like. Um, a health resource, then that cuts into bombs, I think, which is, I think bombs, uh, this, this, like, you shouldn't believe me when I say this, well, believe me, but you shouldn't act on it. Um, I think shmups only make sense with bombs, and I think bombs only ma it makes sense for shmups. Uh-huh. Um, but the problem with a health system is that it cuts into bomb usage, because, like, when is it good to use a bomb versus when should you just take the hit? There's less, mm. there's less onus on the player to bomb in a in a tight spot, mm -hmm. which is where all the thrill comes from. So the idea I had for that prototype was what I called the hang by thread system, where uh, the player is basically in two states. I suppose three, but the first state, everything's fine, we're all good. If they take a hit in that stage, they're down in danger state. Now down mm. in danger state, their um, shot is different, so it's not like it looks a bit weaker. But it's mostly just more narrow, so the player has to endanger themselves a little bit more. Um, and you slowly, slowly, slowly fill the bar to come back out of danger state. So you basically got mm -hmm. one hit, like a barrier almost. And if you take a hit in danger state, there's no lives, that's it, you're done. Go back to the title screen and contemplate what you've done. No lives whatsoever. No lives whatsoever, but bombs. Oh, so the idea wow. the idea was to really put pressure on people to bomb. So if they're in this danger state, like, uh, can I can I really tough it out? Can I really survive this, or should I just bomb to relieve the pressure? Um, so that that's interesting. Yeah, I've seen systems like this. So Actane used that in his cross gunner um, Pico H pop. If you saw that, uh, I'll have a look. Uh, yeah, you check, should check it out. It's it's really interesting. Mm. Um, but also, I saw this in uh, Ren Nine Thousand or Res Nine Thousand. Oh, no, that game. Rim Nine Thousand. Uh, I remember nothing about that game apart from the way it looks. 
Oh, it, it looks amazing because it uses uh, basically the Pico 8 color palette. So that's why mm. I'm kind of partial to this. Okay. It has incredible screen shake. It's like yes. um, eye melting. I'm, uh, not such a fan of screen shake. <laughs> <laughs> but it has like this, the, the, that kind of system that you described. It, um, it, it's kind of like the other way around, though. When you get hit um, you, in the danger state, your weapon is stronger. Mm. So that kind of like encourages skill play, where it's like I'm gonna get hit uh, in, uh, intentionally, so I have more firepower. Mm. Um, yeah, I think there's lots, lots we can do with with health points and and you know questioning some assumptions with which maps. I probably do not agree with you on on the bombs, but it's interesting to see that that to hear that. I'm, I'm are... very strict about the bombs. Yeah. I'm, okay, I'm, that's good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, I, like there are great shooting games out there that don't have bombs, but it's in spite of that. <laughs> Okay, okay. And I'm always uh, going and I'm always going, man, I wish there was a bomb button. That'd be <laughs> I so respect cool. That. I respect that. Okay, so here is maybe like a question that fits well into that discussion. So here is a, a design bonus question, right? Like something mm -hmm. that, that came up during development of our game, like when we work on Pico 8. Um, so like usually modern shmups have like roughly three buttons. I think your game has like basically four to three buttons, depending on whether, you know, um, spread and normal fire mm. is, is two different buttons. Um, but what if... What if you found yourself in a situation where, you, for some reason, you used an engine that only has two buttons? Uh, what would you do then? Would you uh, abandon having like a, a dedicated fire button, so you have a slowdown or like a focus fire button and a bomb button, or would you keep the fire button and then try to solve the bomb uh, and focus fire issue somehow differently? And just make it going. What? Well, how or, does or Giggling Mars do? Matrix? Because Mars Matrix has one button. Mm -hmm. And it's like four. There's like four different things you can do with that fire button. Okay. It's, it's, okay. It all works off that one button. Like, how does it work with one button? So if you tap it very slowly, like it's uh -huh. called the piercing attack. And mm -hmm. then if you tap it kind of rapidly, it's like a your, your normal stream of fire. And if you hold it a little bit, you've got the reflect force or whatever Mars Matrix calls it. But it's the Takumi thing where you're reflecting bullets. If you hold it in all the way for a little bar to fill, it does the gravity hole bomb which is mm -hmm. a big bomb, but you're now left without uh, Reflect Force for like 10, 12 seconds, stuff like that. So four, four functions there all tied to the same button. Um, okay. And th there's kind of a, a conflict there because I think that people do overlook this feeling of controls, like, like the big debate about like movement, motion controls and fighting games, etc. Like there's something... Like the feeling of doing something, like just tap, 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 or holding something down, or tapping like fast in like a, a game that um, rewards such a thing, or that kind of slow tapping in Chor and Sha. Um, mm -hmm. There's a feeling to that, which I think is, it, it's not something completely illusory. It's something that happens in the player's mind, but at the same time, like you have to take accessibility into account, like, and make sure that. If, even if someone has like half of a hand or or, or if they can't match oh. or whatever or if they don't want oh, to match I suppose that they can still play the game um uh, I just I, I think it's unproductive to pretend that the first that first concept doesn't exist mm. like when people say that oh bullet hell games are stupid the fire like you should just always be firing like there's no reason to press mm. the fire button I think that's uh, I think that's a very reductive way of thinking about it even if like Primarily because uh, most bullet hell games have score mechanics that make it so that you have to be very precise about where you're firing, what you're shooting, but also because like, like just moving something around that's automatically firing and pressing something to fire is totally different. I think. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, like the 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 vibes are different. Like once you're causing something to happen, something is happening in your mind that that triggers it. Yeah, like you, the other you, one, it's like you're you're along for the ride, so to speak. Yeah, you might say in your mind palace that like it's oh it's an, basically an automatic action, but it's that's just not how it works when you're in a cabinet or whatever or 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 at home in your boxer shorts pre pressing <laughs> buttons. Like people like to press buttons, man. Let them press buttons. <laughs> Uh, especially if the buttons are really juicy, like an arcade cabinet, where it's like yeah, click, yeah, click, yeah. click, 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 you know. 
Um, I wanted to come back um, because we're almost finished, but I wanted to come back to the screenshot that you sent me of the dev menu because mm. um, there's an uh, interesting dev development mode, like a dedicated uh, debug state that that you talked about, which is fascinating, which is like this DPS, DPS test stage, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so what's the idea there? Well, that was a lesson learned the hard way, which was mm. that, um, and it's a, it's a, it is a harsh lesson. Uh, so when I was balancing all the shot types and all the special weapons, I did this using a spreadsheet. So I said that this fires a bullet. Um, this fires, what, six, like however many bullets a second. Each bullet does X amount of damage. Uh, obviously, just multiply the two and we have a DPS figure. And most... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, sure. Most... Um, like the weapons should have kind of comparable DPS, etc., or you know it should make sense for the amount of ammo that you're investing. Uh, this was a mistake for two reasons. So the in Blue Revolver, as we stand right now, the Val variable shot is really overpowered. Like mm -hmm. again, what we were talking about earlier, like it's not it's not a wholly bad thing, and I would prefer to just lean into making everything strong rather than to to say you're having fun, stop it. Mm -hmm. um, but there was two reasons and they compounded in a kind of multiplicative sense the first was that I thought people would have a harder time using this this shot type because it's like your Dodon patch type B one where it's wiggling around the screen you hold the button to lock it etc so I thought mm -hmm. people would have a hard time um, using that so make it a little bit stronger to compensate, that was a mistake, people got really good at, at using it very quickly and second was that like this, the, the sheet this, the value in the spreadsheet was just not what happened in the game because of like oh. because of like frame rate oddities things can only happen so many times a second little inaccuracies like this yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I know I know the, what the kind of problems they're talking about or like yeah. maybe something pierces or you know all these sorts of things so in the end what I did was I created a game state which is two big squares and one big square it just sums up all the damage that's done to it and it displays it. So hold down your shot and it'll eventually it'll be like 500 or whatever. And the second one uh, does the same thing, but it just averages out per second. So you can get a, a in-game DPS value based on that. Now that's still not super accurate because hmm. for some weapon types, um, damage, uh, in a naive implementation, damage scales with how big an enemy is. If you've got a piercing mm -hmm. weapon, for example, or an AOE weapon, perhaps. Something like that. Um, I, I don't know if I have to explain that in more detail, but I'll just say that like a, a sandbox environment like that is more accurate, but it's not it's, it's not it's not the be-all and the end-all still. Um, but anyway, like spreadsheet, maybe just use it for a, like a base idea, but make sure to do in-game testing and make sure that the actual values of something are what you think they are. I mean, it makes sense, especially for example, um, if you have like spread weapon that shoots in like all those sorts of directions, and then you know just seeing like how much the how high the DPS gets when you get close to an enemy, and then mm -hmm. if you receive from an enemy, like just like seeing how those decisions play out in real life, make makes sense to me. That's that's the classic bog hog gamble beef there. <laughs> uh -huh. Which is um, should like we have weapons that in like a kind of classic kind of old school game where you can only have like so many bullets on screen at one time. Uh -huh. So, I mean, if you think about... The, the like one, the um, shot limit, right? Yes. So the most basic example is, like, Space Invaders or whatever. You can have one shot at a time, Galaga, etc. And you just scale up for, like, somewhat more modern games. So you can have, like, a couple of shots at a time. So when you're up close, you do... It's, you're point-blanking, so you just fire again and again and again because there's no shot limit anymore because all the shots have already collided. Um, I didn't take that approach... There is a you don't like the shot limits. No, um, I mean it's cool. I, I I like it. It's just not what I wanted to do with Blue Revolver, because you've got this this special weapon for doing more damage. Like I felt doing too much of the basic shot would undermine that. Um, going forward, I would probably do, I would probably look at what that achieves, which is um, like you're doing more damage up close and try to just do it in a separate way because the shot limit also has like negatives where like just the, the pattern of fire coming out can be a little bit 
erratic, unpredictable, especially for new players, perhaps. So you might just look at if a shot, if a bullet has been out for half a second, it does X more damage, etc. So, I, I mean, that's that's one thing we've disagreed on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I personally, I'm also a bit skeptical about shot limits. It's, it's, I mean, I understand why people choose it. It's, a, it's it, does, it has like this built-in mechanic, basically. It's got a it's, good feel it to it. It makes everything simpler. It's got a good feel to, it's got a good feel to it when, you, when you're actually harnessing it in a game. Um, it feels good if you master it, but mm. I think it's, it also gets in a way when you're just like shooting normally. Yeah. Because the shots ends kind of quite often end up a bit limp, you know? Mm. What's the game? I was playing Last Alert on PC Engine. And that's just a top-down kind of Ikari Warriors type game. Uh, but that had a, like a super powerful weapon, but it was subject to that, whereas like weaker weapons weren't. So the weaker weapons were actually stronger in most cases. <laughs> Interesting. Huh. So um, this we're talking of balance. So this actually brings me to the question of, um, of difficulty. I and mean, that's kind of like something that I think a lot of designers are still struggling with. Mm. You know, for example, uh, the question... When you're designing a level, it, it, obviously shmups are kind of like are important. The difficulty for shmups is an important question, mm -hmm. and it, it's the question. For example, was uh, that I got quite often is like, what do you design first? Do you first design in the easy or like a normal difficulty, and then when that's done, you go back and then add more enemies, add, add more difficulty to, to create like a more spicy difficulty, or do you start with you know the hardest difficulty level uh, possible and then you scale it back to get the other difficulties? Hardest first. Okay. Every time. <laughs> Just straight Every up. Every time. Why? Because it's easier to tune down than to tune up. We've all played a bad hard mode of a game. Doesn't matter if it's shooting games, it could be bloody uh, Skyrim, I don't know. But we've all played a bad hard mode where just everything's so tanky, everything does just a stupid amount of damage, so it just becomes completely like the gameplay of the game. It, like, it just becomes degenerate. In, in a in a gameplay sense um and but we've not all played a bad easy mode in the same way where it's like oh there's barely any enemies here they all die so fast oh because the the solution to that is obvious you can just increase the difficulty so i think it's much easier to tune down a difficulty progressively than to tune it up so for blue revolver there's a rank system kind of it's more like the god hand system where it's like a bunch of levels that you discreetly move between. And um, so it's five rank levels and I would always design the hardest one first. After I got like a basic sketch of the pattern, the hardest one first and then progressively tune it down. Interesting. And so like when you pick higher difficulty level, then like there's, I think there's like normal, maniac and what is the third one? Normal is the first two rank levels. Mm -hmm. Hyper is all of them. Mm -hmm. And well, nor normal also has auto bomb, which is nice. Hyper is all of them, and parallel, which is the hardest difficulty, is locked to the highest mode. Ah, okay. So you're kind of like tapping into the rank system, and that's how you create the difficulty levels. Mm -hmm. You're just like manipulating how the rank yes. affects the gameplay or how you can. Yeah. That's super smart. It wasn't intended to be something that the player manipulates, it was more just something that sees that the player's having a rough time and eases up just for a little bit, just eases up, right? Okay. And then eventually it comes back. Um, Do you have any visual indicator of what, what rank you have right now? Uh, so Double Action will have a bunch of uh, gadgets, like M2 style gadgets that show this. But in the base game, there is um, a little, you can configure, like by default, there's a little bar at the top of the screen. And it fills up and it goes different colors depending on which cut, which rank, the which level it's at. Okay, I see, I see. Um, so, like speaking of difficulty, there's also like this question, like you know that Mario Maker thing, where you, when you design a very difficult level, you still have to play yourself through that level, and mm. before you can publish this. So, did you? I, assuming you finished your game on hardest difficulty before you published, right? Uh, well, the base benchmark is that I can very reliably do individual sections at the highest difficulty. Mm -hmm. Putting it all together is not something that I can do reliably. Oh, okay. Um, I think I've scored a parallel one CC before. It's like honestly, you just don't play your game like that usually because it's <laughs> it's uh, it's hard for multiple reasons. <laughs> it's hard emotionally. Um, be getting be uh, beaten your uh, by your own game is kind of a humbling experience. Yeah, but in terms of like individual patterns, individual set pieces, or whatever, 
um, I can reliably do them at rank level five. Was was the benchmark? Maybe some things are a little bit spicier, but that's that's the basic idea. Um, I don't really understand designing beyond that in terms of your mechanical skill, but I do think it's pretty fair enough to ask a higher standard of players in terms of their consistency or their tactics, because another part of the puzzle is that I used a fairly weak loadout for all of my testing, like ah, like. Just, so you give you give yourself like a bit of a handicap, right? Not really a handicap. Just just trying to find a baseline, just like your normal narrow shot, plasma lancer, just you know, just nice whatever wholesome whatever little thing, and then everyone's coming in with the weapons that do more damage, and control more and control space more effectively that are perhaps more efficient, or that are a little bit more safe to use. So I think that's fair enough that that. Um, that players can put it together themselves when they've got stuff like that to, to use. I, 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 I've learned a spicy fact about Blue Revolver, which kind of blew my mind. I think I know what this is. And I wanted to pick, you, pick your mind about this because this is kind of like crazy. Can I guess? Uh, yeah. All bullets have a 2.2 pixel hitbox? Yeah, that all of the hitboxes are the same. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> How did you arrive at this decision? Um, I'll I'll be clear. Uh, it it didn't feel right otherwise. A lot of it, oh, okay. a lot of a lot of this kind of tweaking, like the 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 this, like the the code can absolutely have different bullet um sizes. Diff- bullet I assume sizes. like the boss enemies have bullet bigger collision boxes, right? Oh, uh, enemies all have different uh, collisions. Okay. Um, okay. So it's just like bullets and the player ship itself. Just bullets. And there's some mm-hmm. some very special types of enemy bullet which are their own thing, which have a hard, larger hitbox. But your rank and file bullets, even though like some of their beams, some of them are arcs, some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller to a degree, and um, they all have they're all two by two. Now, wow. The first reason for this was that it, it didn't feel right otherwise. A lot of the decisions about that were just based on entirely on feel. Like I've played a l- quite a lot of arcade maps. I've not played so many console ones. But I've played a lot of arcade films, and it was just based entirely upon that, um, because I I think that we can we can put our finger on the scale a little bit, because we're making indie shmups, like mm-hmm. people just like um, they don't need to be the hardest thing in the world, and even if one player gets away a little bit by dodging a bullet that perhaps they shouldn't have. Like they're still gonna have to dodge a hundred more in the next second. Like yeah. we're st- it's still not gonna suffer fools for too long, and it doesn't tangibly lead to any degenerate tactics like moving through bullet walls. Mostly, like I've seen it done a few times, but not consistently, which is mm. fair enough. And sometimes you do want like that. There's a very immortal Ketsui clip that I remember seeing where it's like. The, because sort of because also Ketsui has quite small bullet collision. Um, I think each bullet is like a. It's not like even one pixel by one pixel. It's just a point, like an X Y, just in space. I think, or something mm-hmm. else like that. But anyway, but it's just this clip of a guy just absolutely on the edge of his seat, like got nothing left, no resources left, and he just kind of somehow phases through this huge cluster of shots. And it's because of this, and also because in most cave games, the collision detection runs at 30 hertz. Um, yeah, I, I heard that fact as well. That blows my mind. It's like, how well, did they get away with that? That's amazing, right? And that, and that, should just, put a, that should put a huge smile on your face because everything is permitted. Yeah. Everything is permitted. You know, when you're working with a very limited environment like Pico 8, you know, you, you think about all these things to speed things up and, and how to get more... Uh, bang for your buck, and then you hear about these things that about these you know very experienced developers, do, you know, getting away with that kind of stuff. You know, it's kind of wow. I don't think they should. Be, it's not something that they quote should uh, worry about getting away with. Even it's just it works. So yeah, no harm, no foul. Yeah, sure. Why not? But actually, this brings me to another question that is interesting because I saw on your debug screen that you also can switch the game into 120 uh, frames per second. Mm-hmm. That's is that a, something that you're experimenting with now? That's a feature in Double Action. Um, mm-hmm. It's it, it's it's again. I experimented with it in the Defensor versus the Orb as well, and I was just really curious because I mean I got a high refresh rate screen, and I was like, well, what can this do for the funny games where you shoot up 
and dodge stuff and then mm. press the bomb button hopefully um so yes it will support a 120 hertz mode um there's there's some massaging on the the other side of that uh, what I found really after really looking at things with a fine tooth comb is that if someone tells you their game doesn't have frame rate dependent behavior at all, they're lying. Um, <laughs> they're either lying or they're, they're either lying or they're using like a, a funny tick interpolate thing, which is which is also dependent on tick rate, etc. Um, because like so many things can have so such subtle differences in behavior. And the what we're doing, but what we're doing for um, this option is to just say that this isn't officially supported. There will be mm-hmm. very subtle differences, and just making sure that it's not it's not it's not super different. Like like the bullets aren't going so much faster, or like weapons are still roughly comparable, etc. Probably it's a different scoring category, basically. But mm-hmm. the game will still be basically completely playable. Um, and it's like, because it's not a game that you move up, like look around with using like a mouse or an analog stick, like the differences between 60 and 120 aren't as stark as they are in like a first person shooter. Yeah, there's just not so much changing overall. Not so many pixels are changing on the screen at any given time, right? Mm-hmm. So what, what um, first of all, there's a, a, an, a, an improvement in latency, which is nice. Less input lag, obviously, um, and also like faster. Like if there's a when shots are like really really fast, like a player shot should be, um, then it looks completely different. It has more of a like, like a, almost like a laminar flow looking thing. Yeah, like it yeah, looks yeah, like yeah. Fl- it looks like flowing water or like not flowing. We, we water explored even. the limits of the of what's possible at sixty frames per second, and even in Pico eight, you you can totally yeah. see the difference. Mm. Yes, um, so there's differences there. I think it's a nice feature to have. I don't think it's such a game changer, but again, like uh, more and more people are getting like super nice monitors. So, and I mean, business wise, if your game can offer such a feature and other games don't, well, that's that's nice for you, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I, I'm totally interested in this because, again, it's kind of like uh, these are like these retro games that we're working on. But then having being able to t- take advantage of modern technology is kind of like really interesting to me. Kind of, it's kind of retro, but kind of like modern retro. It's 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 a weird a weird combination. But like the argument with the with the um, with the latency, that's a very important argument, I think, because that's gotten. I feel it's gotten worse uh, in the recent recent decades. <laughs> so it's it's good to to bring it back a little bit. I mean, I'm not like a huge CRT buff. In fact, I know very little about them other than that I used to have one and it was next to our pet chinchilla and our pet chinchilla gnawed a huge hole in the corner of the CRT monitor <laughs> such that you could, gaming setup. <laughs> you could see all the gully works inside. And, uh, the chinchilla died, not because of oh, that. Oh no, though. because of that TV? No, no, no. Okay. No, no it, was, it, was our, it was our computer monitor. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, so I, I know very little about it, t- but I'm, I, I, I believe that on a CRT you can have over 60 hertz, like, uh, quote, naturally. I, I mean, it's difficult because they, you have also like, you know, the interlacing and stuff like that. It's, mm. it, CRT technology is black magic. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how they made yeah, this. Like, this. This is all crazy stuff. In terms of input lag, um, Mark of the Electric Underground, I think he did a pretty, like, I mean, the best out there in terms of comparing the input lag of a bunch of uh, shooting games and like ports and indie games. Blue Revolver came out quite high, uh, low rather, in terms of input lag. Like, yeah, uh, good. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like two frames or something. Um, so that's nice. Um, though, like you say, it is definitely getting worse because people are playing on like stuff like the Switch or the Steam Deck, which seem to have quite a lot of input lag going on. Yeah. Or they're being pushed into like the whole cloud gaming thing. Uh, one last technical question about the 120, uh, 120 FPS. So, like recording replays is such a big deal for um, for shmups. Um, mm. I feel, and uh, how, is, did that cause any problems switching to one hundred twenty frames per second? Because you kind of have to calculate every frame, and then so I guess we have like two different sets of replays for one hundred twenty frames per second and sixty frames per second. Still right? working on how that's going to be presented to the end user. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, that, like you, you're not gonna make a 120 hertz uh, replay work on a 60 hertz like set. Like if the game is if, 
if the viewer's game is set to 60. So what if they're if their setup can't support like 120 hertz gameplay and they want to watch 120 hertz gameplay like replay then tough luck i'm I'm sorry um i think that's what it's gonna have to be i don't see a different way to do it but definitely like they're different categories different categories of replay that aren't really interchangeable maybe for people watching because this might be a bit surprising but it's like the problem there, maybe maybe you can speak to it a bit better, but for what I understand is like when you're recording a replay in a, in a shmup or in a, in a game like this, mm. you are recording the player inputs. Yes. Right? And and so the file can be really small. You're not recording like a video capture of the, of the, of the playthrough. You're recording just the player inputs. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to design the game in a way that when you replay it with exactly those inputs, it will play out exactly the same way. Mm. Fully, fully deterministic. Yeah. Um, so which, like random numbers are kind of like you, you cannot do random numbers you have to do some kind of other way of generating randomness so to speak you can, absolutely, you can absolutely do random numbers they just have to be seeded um, so like it's a matter of using that the same seed all the time or encoding the seed in the replay you could do either either's fine um, so but yeah like in, in the terms of our our game it's just uh, it's it's literally just a screenshot. It's like a snapshot of the player's input state every single frame, along with some dummy, like some like test values, just to make sure that there's no desync. Like, what's the score? How many entities are there on the screen? That sort of thing, just to make sure that we can spot desync ahead of time. Well, not not ahead of time when it happens, because once desync's happened, there's not much you can do about it. Um, there's a little bit of stuff like. If we think about adding a, like a, a mode where like there's less particles or so on, because particles call in the random number generator, uh, then yeah, that'll yeah. make replays desync. So how do you deal mm -hmm. with that? Do you just force one value when you're watching replays or something? I don't know. And then uh, yeah, this file is just compressed and it's they're they're quite small, they're megabytes, which you know most people can deal with these days. The the in terms of love, it was generally pretty easy to um to the whole replay thing the only problem was that one of the libraries we were, use, we were using the timer library um to be specific for sports fans it's the timer module in hump mm -hmm. all of uh, love's uh, community libraries are called uh have kind of funny names like that hump is it is because uh, of love yeah stuff like that mm. um, i'm actually not going to repeat some of them because they're uh, <laughs> Not, might not be family friendly yeah if you if you look on like uh, the awesome love to the github uh, page uh you'll probably see what i'm talking about i mean uh the best tiles library for using that map editor is called sti oh, oh okay okay yeah <laughs> i think it's been renamed now um, i think the community's kind of grown out of that a little bit because it's uh, it's a bit yeah, more, it's, it's a bit more bougie mm. now that it's got like uh full commercial games running on love Mm -hmm. I guess, um, but this the timer module of Hump. If you schedule two function calls at the same for the same time, like mm -hmm. one function in not point one seconds, one function not point one seconds, um, at the same time, it's non deterministic which one it executes first. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I see the problem. Mm -hmm. It was a very simple fix, but knowing that that's the problem is 95% of the struggle. So it, it took, a, took a fair amount of debugging to realize that that was the issue. I mean, oh yeah, I can imagine. This, this might be might be difficult. To I mean, I, uh, the, uh, first I concluded, oh, it must just be impossible. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things, especially when you're working on like a shmup or whatever, where it's like, I'm all alone. No one else has had to solve <laughs> this problem. Well, yes. many people have had, but most of them are Japanese or dead. Sometimes both. Um, <laughs> So it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to communicate and uh, ask, um, and like if you ask a generalist audience, they'll give you kind of really unhelpful Stack Overflow answers like, "Oh, you yeah. should decouple your game logic from the render." <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if you if you the viewer are using Love Two D and are using the Tiber module in Hump then just be wary for that. So that's that's one thing to look out for. That's, that's, a, that's a nice tip. That's a nice tip right there. It might have been fixed because uh, we were using an old version, obviously. 
Okay, so I think we we got like a broad idea um, of of how you went about it. I'm still I'm still kind of blown away that that, that you have like such a such a crazy approach. Um, but okay, so you're working now on on uh, double action, right? Mm-hmm. When uh, do you have an idea no, of no, when that? Uh, no. Okay, I'm no. gonna. Another question that maybe a lot of people are asking um, is. Uh, do, 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 do you consider maybe putting um, Blue Revolver or Double Action on, on consoles? Is that it's even a, possible with, with Love? It's absolutely possible. Um, there's I've, I've seen games that run on Love on the Switch, at least. And I'll be, I'll level with you. I'm a total Linux head, like a total Ooh. open source. Like, um, I, there's no secret here. If you open up the Blue Revolver executable in like an archive editor, all the code is there. I didn't mm-hmm. obfuscate it or anything. Even though you could with Love, you can decomp- you can compile it to like a Lua C file, and it'll be like it'll run it'll run about the same, but it'll just be people won't be able to see what it's doing. But if you are curious about what our game does, you can look in the, the file and see exactly what it does. You can edit it. You can do whatever you want. Nice. And I'm happy with that. It's not under an open license yet. Looking at that, trying to think about what's the best approach because uh, trying to walk that tightrope with a commercial game is not something that's often done. I would be very careful about this. We had some bad experience recently with um, with like NFT stuff, and mm. oh man, it gets really really nasty. Well, the nice thing about making a shooting game is that um, people generally it, it's not a, it's not a super popular genre, so mm. you know if there's a grip if there's grifters going around, it will probably be not targeting indie shmup developers yeah, well uh, the thing is like when there's grifters going around they will be targeting exactly those people who are don't have the power to sue you you know when, when that's true goes wrong. and one thing so, that you learn very fast um as soon as you have a game on steam is that you get a lot of emails asking for keys steam keys steam yeah keys <laughs> you know from people who have oh we've we followed your game since the very start in october 2016 and we would really love 5,000 Steam keys <laughs> for our re- little review channel. Look, it's got 17 subscribers. We're just starting mm-hmm. out. Could we have so many keys? Yeah, it's 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 a it's an ongoing problem. And I think uh, ever since I it was already happening back in 2010 when I released my game on Steam, and uh, it's it's gotten only worse. I think. Yep. Um, so. Do you have like maybe any advice that you would give to like aspiring shmup devs? What's something that you wished somebody would have told you before you started out? Mm. Just brought. Make the player bullets faster. <laughs> Just make them faster. Like there's no speed limit. There's, you're not gonna break into non-Newtonian physics anytime soon. Just make them quite fast. Like mm-hmm. where 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 I naturally thought, yeah, that's fast enough. It was not nearly fast. It was enough. not fast enough. No, and as it's soon never as fast enough. and as soon as someone pointed that out to me, I was like, oh my god, this game looks like jelly. <laughs> and then as as soon as that changed, it's it's like the whole. Have you heard the story about the Wolf three D gun? No, I can't remember which gun it was in Return to Castle Wolfenstein. Sorry, um, but. Is that this is like an online game back in whenever, like not notes or something, and everyone thought this game is this gun is so weak. I think it was a Tommy gun. Let's let's say it was a Tommy gun for the sake of argument. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And people were like, "This gun is so bad. Who would ever use it? It's so weak." Uh, I, I think we now know where this is going. And what they did was they went in, they looked at the sound file for the Tommy gun, and they gave it more bass. That's all they did. Or something like that. They changed the sound file, and suddenly, like this gun is amazing. It's this. It's, you fix this it. Gun will cook my breakfast and give me a pat on the head at the same time. It's amazing. So yeah, yeah, like as soon as like you change the bullet velocity and like your player fire, that has some like it changes the balance a little bit, I suppose. But mostly, it just makes it feel better and more powerful. And um, so yeah, the the point. If you're like me and you're bouncing by vibes and that sort of thing, you should probably make those player bullets faster. Mm-hmm. That's, and, that's, that's a good advice. We definitely went over that that one, but it's a good reminder uh, that that this is this is important. Yes. Another mm-hmm. thing about development strategy, I suppose, feedback is great and it can be the wind under your sail sometimes. But accept it with this caveat, which is the players are naturally problem solvers. Mm. 
that's what they do. They problem solve every time they open up a game in Steam or Itch or I don't know, whatever, GeForce experience, I don't know. Um, players are naturally problem solvers. So they will describe, if they have an issue, they'll describe a solution. So what all those people, what the Return to Castle Wolfenstein developers heard was this gun should be buffed. You should make this gun stronger and not what the problem was, which is this gun sounds weak. It feels weak. So understand that players will describe a solution instead of a problem. So, and I sort of don't envy um, developers right now. Not just yeah. right now, but like there's a bit of playing politics with the audience sometimes. Like, are, are you addressing player feedback? Are you being dishonest with people? But like, it's a indie schmuck. People are probably not going to care so much. Like, you're not going to get uh, millions. Like. There's not going to be a YouTube video about how you're so dishonest that has like five million views or whatever. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, understand. It's, it's, you should be so lucky to get that kind of feedback. You know? Yeah, yeah. So understand <laughs> what players are saying. Just understand as well that you might have to um, address what they're saying from a different angle and look at what's mm -hmm. the actual problem here. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent suggestion. Yeah, that's really cool, dude. We've been we've been at it for almost two hours now, so um, I think we have to we have to wrap it up. I think, but I think we covered most of the stuff that we wanted to talk about. Hmm. Um, where can people reach you? Where can can check out your stuff? That's a hard question right now, ain't it? Uh, hmm. Thanks, Elon. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, right. You yes. were on Twitter, right? Yeah. So I was on Twitter. I'll, I'll probably still be on there for business updates, etc. Just for. Showing stuff off of the the social media I actually enjoy using right now is cohost cohost.org slash Danbo. So I, I post stuff on there. Uh, don't go looking for like W uh, work in progress stuff. Mostly just uh, post silly things. But if, if you're looking to keep abreast, um, you can check that out or uh, Twitter like underscore underscore Danbo. Um, I made it really awkward for some reason. <laughs> uh, I'll probably end up on Blue Sky or whatever people gel to on um, for self promotion, etc. Um, but yeah, okay, sweet, sweet. And of course, you have an itch your website where eventually double double uh, action will will drop, right? Yes, yes. Rest assured, as soon as there's a, a date for that, that I can be wholly confident in, I will blow the horn. Excellent. And the gamers will come from all around. We're going to hear more from you in the future. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Okay, so um, again, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for being so thorough and, and giving us this, this insight into, into your crazy process. Um, this is really exciting. And it's also exciting to see that how different it is from our previous interview. That, that was really fun. Uh, do you have any last words of encouragement for aspiring shmup devs out there? You know, I've heard it said that the shooting game genre is fated for obscurity, death, stagnation. If fate is the dream of a tyrant, let hope be their nightmare. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> no words, just slow clap. Thank you again for Danbo for joining us and sharing his secrets. And you out there, if you have any additional questions, be sure to post them in the comments. This was the second interview in a series of five. If you liked what you just saw, I have a second interview like this on my channel with the creator Barkhawk. And if you want to see more interviews in the future, be sure to subscribe. I also have a coffee set up at coffee.com slash laserdevs if you want to support my work as a little perk. My supporters usually get access early to new videos if you can't wait that long. But for now, thank you so much for watching and see you next time around, guys. Bye bye.